Hello and welcome to today's Cell and Gene Therapy Insights webinar on Capsid Titer Quantification for AAV-based therapeutics. I'm Elisa Manzotti, founder of BioInsights, and I'm delighted to be joined today by our two presenters, John Chappell from Gyros Protein Technologies and Tom Vidkos from AstraZeneca. First up, we'll have a presentation by John and Tom. Uh, you won't be hearing too much of my dulcet tones today, as following the presentation, John will be hosting our Q&A session. So do feel free to pose your questions to our speakers using the Ask a Question box under the viewing pane. And so it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. First is John Chappell, Application and Service Director for EMA Asia Pacific at Gyros Protein Technologies. John has over 25 years of experience in the contract research industry, supporting both preclinical and clinical drug development, specializing in supporting biological compounds from an analytical perspective. And he is joined by Tom Vickos, scientist at AstraZeneca. During his PhD and postdoctoral research at the University of Manchester, Tom investigated the pathology of rare genetic diseases. And in 2018, he joined Medimmune, now AstraZeneca, to work on the bioassay development for in vivo express biologics, including AAV-based therapeutics. And with that, I will now hand over to John to kickstart the presentation today. Thank you. Today's presentation will examine AAV applications on the Gyrolab immunoassay platform. First, I will start with a general introduction to the Gyrolab technology before handing over to Thomas for his specific AAV presentation. You will be invited to ask questions, which we will try and answer at the end of the webinar. Please type your questions in the question box and we'll try and answer as many questions as possible at the end. First, we start with an introduction to the Gyrolab immunoassay platform. This is an automated immunoassay platform. We supply instruments and additional support to run the system in a regulated environment. This includes Gyrolab CDs, which I will go into later in the presentation. Uh, we supply ready-to-use kits, particularly in the bioprocess area, and consumables such as our specific buffers, as well as software modules for specific applications and to ensure regulatory compliance. We also offer extensive training and support and use of the platform. Both systems we offer will complete your assay from start to finish. Uh, the Expand is our 5CD system. It allows temperature control of samples and reagents. And this system gives maximum flexibility and allows you to run multiple assays at the same time. The Explorer is a smaller system, still a very fast system and a very flexible system. Both are very well supported. The aim of this technology is to give great performance by automating immunoassays. The technology gives great precision, a large dynamic range, and low sensitivity, as well as using low sample volume. Assay runtime of approximately one hour means rapid development of assays and quick turnaround of data. It saves analyst times and make, uh, makes a lab more productive. The heart of the technology is the CD, which allows immunoassays to run in nanoliter scale. This allows an automated integrated workflow. Detection is achieved using high sensitivity laser induced fluorescence. The software is designed for operating in a regulated environment. And as already mentioned, the assay runtime is less than one hour per CD. Looking at the CD in more detail, they contain microstructures. Reagents and samples are introduced into the microstructures by the instrument. At the bottom of the microstructure is a streptavidin column. 
The capture reagent is biotinylated. Movement through the microstructure is achieved by capillary action and centrifugal forces. And hydrophobic barriers control movement within the CD in combination with the centrifugal force. Sample volume is controlled by the CD and minimize analytic error by pipetting. There are different vo CD volumes, such as 20 nanoliter, 200 nanoliter, and 1,000 nan nanoliter, giving flexibility in terms of assay range. And different, uh, different CDs can be used for the same assay, for example. And because of the way that the, the, the system is read and the individual uh, microstructures, no crosstalk and, and it, it, no crosstalk is there, and also a broad analytical range. Gyros is extensively used in the drug development. Bioanalytically, it's used for PK, biomarker, and ADA. And in, in bioprocess, it's used for impurity testing and product titer. Which leads us on to the topic of today's talk. The Gyro Lab is, is being extensively used in cell and gene therapy application. This includes both AAV and lentivirus uh, drug development. The low volume and fast turnaround really suit this exciting new area. I will now pass you on to Thomas, who will give you his specific AAV presentation. Thank you very much, John, for the introduction. Um, so today I would like to present you a content essay for capsid titer quantification, which I developed on the JaroLab platform. First, I would like to introduce you to AAVs, adeno-associated viruses. They are small, non-enveloped viruses with single-stranded genome of nearly 5 kb length. AAV genome encodes several proteins, including three viral proteins that compose their capsid, and the genome is flanked by ITRs, inverted terminal repeats. Wild-type AAVs have quite broad tissue tropism, and most of us are usually exposed to wild-type AAVs in early childhood. In general, humans do not have pre-existing immunity to AAVs, and there are not no, uh, no known AAV-related human diseases. This feature um, make AAVs an attractive therapeutic tool for gene delivery used in cell and gene therapies. Although AAVs are generally considered safe and efficacious, there have been a few issues identified with AAV-based therapeutics. And here uh, I'm presenting two of them, uh, pre-existing uh, uh, AAV neutralizing antibodies, uh, which are found in some patients, and also a possibility to develop a cytotoxic immune response towards AAV uh, transduced cells, uh, and this is uh, um, via CD8 positive T cell pathways. Wild type AVs can integrate with the host genome, while recombinant AVs, so called R AVs, do not integrate or replicate because the genomes are devoid of rep and cap genes and the DNA stays in the episomal form in the nucleus. There are 12 wild type AV serotypes identified to date and a number of isolates. They vary in the tissue tropism. You can clearly see that certain organs, for instance the liver, is preferentially targeted by more than one serotype. And it is now increasingly popular to engineer AV capsids by random or directed mutagenesis in order to obtain new versions with lower immunogenicity, uh, increased transgene payload, or uh, more targeted tissue trophies. But this also raises new challenges for capsid type assays. AAVs are increasingly popular therapeutic modality with a great number of ongoing trials. I have listed some of them on the right-hand slide. On the left, I have reiterated clear advantages of AAV therapeutics with a good safety profile, long-lasting expression of the therapeutic transgene, and also the ability to transduce replicating and non-replicating cells. However, New modalities require new methods of analytical testing in order to examine potential critical quality attributes, so-called PCQAs. Monoclonal antibodies are being manufactured for more than 30 years, and there are a number of analytical tests 
assets which are already established to test them. Most of assets are based on platform-based uh, uh, platform methods and do not require development, can be readily adapted for new products. On the contrary, AV-based drugs require a number of new assays. Uh, some of them I highlighted in pink, just to show you that uh, they address uh, quantity, purity, process, and product-related impurities, which are quite unique to that modality. And uh, for our team uh, at AstraZeneca, that also meant uh, development of these methods. Uh, and one of the um, important categories for specifications for biologics is quantity. For antibodies, this is uh, mainly protein content. But for AV, the product is usually a mix of two possible viral species. Viral particles containing the, the, the viral genome, so-called FU particles, and viral particles devoid of the genome, so-called empty. And it is important to notice that there can be only up to one viral genome copy per capsid. Viral genome content is uh, quantified using PCR-based techniques and reported as viral genome copies per unit of measure, usually uh, milliliter. Equally important to quantify is viral capsid content, which is the number of capsid particles per ml. This is traditionally measured by ELISA or ELISA-like immunoassays. Knowing the two attributes, it is possible to determine empty to full capsid ratio because viral genome content quantifies full particles, so particles containing the viral genome, while capsid content measures both empty and full capsids. These two methods allow absolute quantification, but there are a few orthogonal analytical methods also available to determine percentage of empty and full capsid in specimens. For example, uh, one can use uh, transmission electron microscopy, analytical ultrasuppurgation, charge detection mass spectrometry, or UV spectrophotometry. Knowing the number of empty particles is important clinically, um, and empty particles or particles with partial genomes are considered impurities by regulatory agencies and require process control strategy. For the capsid titer assay, we decided to use JIRLAB platform to, de to develop an immunoassay. As John Orr has already mentioned, this technology is based on using CDs with segments containing streptavidin resin for capture. Uh, it uses nanoliter microfluidics, which is fully integrated with the JIRLAB platform, and also allows using small volumes of samples for measurements and allows assay automation. Our assay setup is based on the retention of a biotinated antibody targeting AAVs on streptavidin beads, which then acts as a capture antibody for AAV particles. Uh, AAV particles are captured and then detected with another AAV-specific antibody conjugated with a fluorophore. Uh, in, in this case, it's Alexa 647. During the assay run, we run a dilution series of samples with unknown titer together with a reference standard with known capsid titer. This allows us comparing response of analyzed samples with the reference standard in order to interpolate absolute capsid titer of samples. Together with, with um, uh, viral genome titers, which are quantified with a PCR-based method, we are able to also determine the percentage of full capsids in the samples. Initially, during uh, our assay development, we decided to examine a number of um, AV-specific antibodies and their suitability as capture and detection antibodies in the assay. We tested six different combinations of three antibodies, and we have noticed very similar response curves. So each curve here on the graph represents one antibody pair. On the graph, response values are plotted on the y-axis in logarithmic scale, and capsid concentrations in, is plotted on the x-axis, also in logarithmic scale. Journal Lab Viewer was a very helpful tool for us to understand binding profiles of outliers to quality control the data. And um, during uh, several initial runs, we could see a number of outliers that we aimed to remove in order to further improve the assay. We use different antibody co combinations together with different Rexit buffers, which are recommended by JARUS to prepare sample dilutions. We compared assay performance in three buffers, Rexit AN, which is a buffer with increased salt concentration, uh, so with increased ionic strength, 
uh, Rexip S, which is a buffer with addition of uh, detergent, and also Rexip A max, which is a standard buffer, but used at two times concentration. As you can see, use of uh, Rexip S lowered the number of outliers for all, an all examined antibody pairs, increased a bit the sensitivity of the methods, and improved precision. For further assay development, uh, because of the uh, performance availability and also cost of goods, we decided to go forward with the AB1 and AB2 antibody pair and with the Rexip F buffer for sample dilutions. Um, and also, uh, looking at response curves, we have noticed that we had to use PMT 25% detector setting for optimal dynamic range uh, of um, uh, uh, of our capsid titer quantification. We also wanted to ensure that our assay is sensitive for our, uh, for our purposes. And for that reason, we have explored different CD types. Uh, so that's uh, already something that John mentioned. And we decided to move from BioAFI 200 to BioAFI 1000 CD in the final assay setup. BioAFI 1000 uses more sample volume, which increases the amount of capture analyte, hence increased response. But even with increased sample volume for this type of CD, we still use significantly lower sample volumes compared to traditional uh, plate-based immunoassays. This allows us to lower um, CVs and also increase dynamic range of this method to 3.5 log. We also wanted to examine specificity of the method. And this was particularly important for us because uh, the antibody pair that we finally settled on uses a capture antibody that uh, has quite broad specificity to many AAV serotypes. Um, so we wanted to determine that the serotype-specific detection antibody that we are using is sufficient to ensure detection of only this serotype in the assay. In this experiment, we used two AAV serotypes and two detection antibodies, specific for X and Y serotypes. You could clearly see on the left-hand graph that a AB2 detection antibody yields dose-dependent response only for X serotype and not for the Y serotype. On the other hand, AB4, which is specific for Y serotype, was able to detect only Y serotype and not X serotypes. And this shows that the assay is serotype specific, but also proves that the assay setup can be readily adapted for capsid quantification of virus AAV serotypes by substituting a serotype specific detection antibody. Next, we wanted to directly compare um, assay performance against a commercial AAV capsid ELISA. In this case, in, in sorry, in this kit, uh, plates are pre-coated with a serotype specific antibody. And the same uh, antibody, but bitylated, is then used for detection with a standard TMB-based colorimetric readout. That assay turns out to be quite precise and have a relatively low lower limit of quantification, just below 10 to the power of 9 caps particles per ml for that examined serotype. However, when we tested our samples, we can so that's the graph on the right-hand side, you can clearly see that the dynamic range of the assay is uh, lower compared to the uh, gyros assay, and um, it's, it is around 1 to 1.5 log. And this uh, poses a challenge when you quantify samples with expected varied concentrations of capsids. I think the very good example here are in-process samples uh, from the purification process that uh, may contain varied um, uh, capsid titers depending on the purification steps, the concentration steps as well, and, and uh, filtration steps. And in order to ensure that samples are uh, correctly quantified, it would be required to run several dilution points uh, or more dilution points, uh, points would be needed for correct quantification. We also did quite thorough comparison of the commercializer and our jar lab method. Here I'm actually presenting you just one result, but this is in agreement with what we have seen for other samples. So basically there is a very good correlation be between reported caps tighter values obtaining using both methods. And um, finally, I would like to present you an interpolation method, uh, which uh, we use for quantification of samples. So traditionally, for this type of analysis, you plot your dilution points of test sample on the standard curve, read off the value, 
and adjust it for dilution of uh, of uh, for dilution by multiplying results by sample dilution factor. Then a geometric mean is calculated in order to obtain a final value. This approach gives equal weight to all points, and points that lie outside of top and bottom asymptotes have to be excluded from the analysis. We decided to try to use an alternative method that not only plots a curve for the standard, but also plots a curve for dilutions of the test samples. So both uh, curves, in our example, that's a 4PL fit, have to share A, B, and D parameters, but they will differ in the position of, on, or on the um, x-axis. So they do differ in the C parameter. And the difference in C parameter is the distance between the two curves on the x-axis is actually your quantification results. And this allows weighting uh, to dilution points and ensures that all points contribute to the final results, even those that lie quite close to the asymptotes, and take into account uh, also a variability of uh, measurements uh, at different concentrations. And this allows us to get more accurate results with smaller uh, number of dilutions needed per run, and also uh, it would then um, allows us to use less complicated dilution schemes for samples with varied capsid content. Again, for example, in process uh, um, uh, sample testing. So uh, to summarize, I, I, today I presented you a capsid titer essay developed on the JARLA platform. The essay yields comparable results to the commercial ELISA kits, but have increased dynamic range compared to the standard ELISA. The essay setup uses a capture antibody with a broad AAB serotype specificity and a serotype specific detection antibody that ensures uh, that the essay is um, specific. But also this approach has proven to be versatile in a way that it's easily adaptable for quantification of other AAB serotypes. And while developing essays on general platform, I would like to encourage uh, you to uh, test different Rexit buffers, different CD types, in order to maximize assay precision, accuracy, and sensitivity. And uh, also at the end, I have shown you an alternative method for interpolation analysis that you may find useful for uh, capsitizer quantification, but also for other uh, uh, interpolation analysis. And uh, at the end, I would like to um, acknowledge uh, a number of my colleagues that helped with the essay development, uh, uh, Babs, Max, and Zongying. Also, uh, Ian from Quantix for his work on the alternative uh, interpolation method, and Anne from Jaros, who has supported essay development. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Thomas, um, for your presentation. First, I would like to uh, start with some questions. Um, we do actually have a number of questions in, so I, I will move on to the first question that I have. So the first question is, uh, what were your particular reasons for developing the assays using the GyroLab platform rather than, than using traditional ELISA? Um, I think the first reason is that there are no um, not a lot of available commercial kits for uh, accurate capsid quantifications. And uh, after evaluating commercial kits uh, available on the market for uh, uh, ELISAs, we have decided that uh, it, they do not provide a dynamic range that would be needed for us. Um, I think we're looking for maybe more accurate assay. Also for AV therapeutics, especially at the beginning of uh, of your research, uh, you do not have a lot of uh, some uh, like sample volumes, so you really want to uh, sp spend only a minimal amount uh, needed for uh, reliable quantifications because you really want to use AV therapeutics for, for example, your um, uh, animal model trials. And um, also, I think it was uh, uh, interesting for us to. Uh, observed that uh, uh, with uh, JARLAB, we were able to uh, automate our essay, and it is now routine for me to run you know, a number of samples per week, and uh, using JARLAB really saves us time. Thank you, Thomas. So another question. 
Um, can you comment on where you obtained your reagents? Were these from internally derived or from commercial sources or both? Um, that's an interesting question. So actually for us, it was from commercial sources. I think uh, it uh, would be quite important here to stress out and maybe something that uh, this is something that I haven't stressed out in the presentation, but I would like to is to be quite careful with the antibody selection, because there are a number of uh, antibodies that are obviously raised against viral proteins which would potentially work on uh, unassembled viral proteins, so in denaturing conditions, but they will not be able to detect uh, viruses in its native conformation, which would be essential for that type of assays. And also, uh, I think this is something which I think not uh, that much attention is uh, paid, although this is really critically important, making sure that uh, your antibodies actually detect intact particles. So when the antibodies are raised, they are raised uh, against a AV, uh, so AV particles are uh, being a uh, uh, source of um, uh, immune response for the, uh, the during animals' uh, e immunization during antibody production, just to make sure that the antibodies do recognize intact particles only, because what you really do not want to do is quantify just free proteins that could be, especially in your early in-process samples uh, during purification process, that would give you unnaturally high uh, uh, and inaccurate results. Thank you, Thomas. So next question, uh, can you comment on potential aggregation of, of AAV particles? This is something I've heard that people are concerned with because I noticed from your uh, gyros buffer selection that this actually may indicate aggregation because obviously the, the buffer with increased detergent obviously helped the assay performance. Uh, yes. So um, actually, the the, um, the serotype that we have used for this assay development is particularly stubborn in a way that it is uh, known that it uh, sort of form this very transient aggre or like, uh, aggregates that are still fully functional. But that's really you what you do not want to have uh, during uh, any sort of immune assays. So for us, it was really important to find uh, optimal buffer conditions in order to minimize this um, uh, aggregation. I can tell that actually for, I have worked with a few serotypes so far uh, using the Jarla platform, and uh, that serotype which was prone to uh, form aggregates was the most challenging one. It was just unfortunate that that was the serotype that we have started our essay development. But on the other hand, it also allowed us to develop the right essay from the very beginning. Perfect. Um, I'm not sure you're going to be able to answer this question, but I'll answer it anyway. Which serotype are you particularly testing in your study? Ha. So there are a number of serotypes. I think that's maybe something I cannot go uh, into too much details publicly. But uh, I, I would say uh, most of these serotypes uh, should be able to be quantifiable even using our um, our essay setup and I think this gives you really a big versatility especially when it comes to capsid engineering so something that doesn't exist normally in nature that uh, normal antibodies may not pick up and then making custom reagents uh, would be an essential uh, thing to do for the um, essay development but again uh, knowing that uh, your platform can be used for uh, for efficient caps uh, quantification, I think this you uh, this gives you a good comfort in order to try and develop this novel uh, essays as well. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Uh, another question: Is it possible to modify the method fast uh, two months in brackets for other similar viruses, for example, H H P V, for example, where capsid ELISA is already established? I would say probably yes, but I'll, I'll let you answer that. Uh, I would say yes as well. I think here the only concern, potential concern I would have, is just to check what's the uh, what's the diameter of your of your uh, uh, virus. So uh, in case of AAVs that um, uh, they are non-enveloped and the diameter of the capsid is uh, up to 25 uh, nanometers, so that's definitely sufficient in order in order for it to work in the microfluidic platform. So as long as you are not uh, um, 
uh, quantifying something extremely big that doesn't go uh, through the nine microfluidic system, that should definitely work. And maybe John, you can comment more in terms of the the, the like actual sizes. Yeah, I mean, people are, uh, are have developed assays using sort of particles as well, so quite large particles. So I'm, I won't give an exact size today, but uh, I think pretty much um, it is possible to move quite large um, particles through their microfluidics. So, so the next question, um, can you differentiate empty versus full particle by this method? Yes. So as I have mentioned, uh, this method on its own is not going to be sufficient in order to make this discrimination because it only, uh, so it will quantify every single viral particle you have present in your sample. So that can be um, uh, both particles containing viral genome and also not containing uh, viral genomes. So you would be quantifying both empty and full capsids. However, in conjunction with a method that uses the viral genome capsid, you will be able to make a ratio of, uh, um, of a titer which will contain only uh, genome-containing particles versus a titer of all particles, and that gives you a percentage of particles that do contain a genome, so that will be called full capsid particles. And we have actually a uh, so we uh, have done some evaluation together with a qPCR-based method uh, versus some of the uh, physical chemical methods that I have mentioned during my presentation that do not look at the absolute quantification, but rather just on the proportion of the uh, of the empty full particles in the samples. And you could see a very good agreement between this uh, orthogonal method as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. You can also use the same antibody for both capture and detection for an AAV serotype. Is this due to the multi multivalent of AAV epitopes? That's correct. So I think this is a very good advantage of like any kind of viruses that you will have more than one epitope present in one particle, which means that you will be able to amplify this reaction and uh, get quite good sensitivity. And in our hands, we could actually use the same antibody, even monoclonal antibodies, um, used both for detection and uh, and capture. In our case, uh, we decided to use two different antibodies uh, because of like several reasons. But uh, I, uh, based on solely performance of the assay, definitely uh, you could use the same antibody pair. Okay, thank you. And next question, what is the quantitative range for the gyros? So I think that's really depends on the serotype as well. So I think I have looked with this method on three different serotypes. And what I could see is there was a tiny differences between the, 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 the range of the assay. I would say probably varying between 2.5 to like 3.5 logs. Um, and I think this is also due to affinity of antibodies. So uh, the one which I was, uh, which I'm using for capture, which do recognize most of AV serotypes, do recognize most of them, but to a different strength. So you potentially may have to play around with the amount of the capture antibody used, uh, or um, uh, the uh, like wash steps in order to uh, make this uh, dynamic range even bigger. But I would say in, in my hands, at least for the serotypes that I have tested, uh, 2.5 log was the minimum uh, dynamic range of the assay. Perfect, thank you. So the next question is, what is the throughput per run for your assay? I think this is really depends on, um, again, your assay setup. So for us, uh, especially for that serotype that I was mostly uh, focused in my presentation, so the one that sometimes forms this transient aggregates, and you do get now with our assay setup minimum number, but still you do get some outliers. I, for example, for the reference curve, I'm running uh, it in triplicates just to ensure that I have a very good fit. So for that, you, your uh, sample throughput is going to go slightly lower. 
But I would say, so our machine that we're using is a 5CD machine. And uh, I usually do, uh, I mean, depends on the specifics of the samples, but I would say four dilution series per sample is sufficient for me to get uh, an accurate uh, titer of that particular sample, um, especially when it comes to in-process samples. Perhaps for the uh, release assay, you may want to increase the number of uh, uh, dilution samples. That would give me uh, uh, around uh, ability to test 50 samples in four different dilution series, sorry, uh, dilution points in five cities. Perfect, thank you. So we do have a question is uh, whether you can sh mind sharing the vendor information of your AAV antibodies that you've used and the standard commercially. So that's potentially something that would be able uh, I would be able to discuss, but probably more on uh, if, if if someone would like to uh, approach me. So uh, I think this is uh, still a bit of an issue for many of the AV stereotypes. I will just make a quick comment on uh, standards that only a few standards uh, only for a few AV stereotypes there are available commercial standards. Uh, with known capsid titer, and then when you're uh, um, starting to develop uh, uh, your therapeutic with a completely novel stereotype that is not present there, um, then uh, it is always a chicken and egg question of how you make your reference standard first and qualify it for its then use for your um, sample um, measurements. Also, I think an important thing to mention is that if your uh, capsids are engineered, so even one point mutation on the capsid, I would say you should not really use a, a wild type AV uh, serotype as your standard because the affinity uh, uh, for the for like binding of different antibodies may do differ and you may do not get accurate absolute um, quantification. Thank you. Um, a question actually how the, the jar was method compares in terms of aggregation with commercial ELISA kits? Because I think it's something that's been reported that uh, when people are uh, testing samples, that aggregation has been noticed when run it, running ELISAs. Um, I'm not sure if I can actually comment on this. So, uh, well, you know, there are different buffer types used uh, as well. I think the good thing about JaroLab is, uh, as I have shown you, uh, you can always go to JaroLab Viewer and looking at the binding profile always helps you to understand whether the outlier is just a true uh, like measurement or it's really an aggregate. You can really easily to spot it while, you know, using a standard 96 well plate and just having an absorbance readout, it's not going to help you with troubleshooting. Okay, excellent, thank you. So a question is uh, to comment on the measurement error with the method that you developed. Um, so our method, I would say, is not fully finalized, but at the moment, uh, uh, so far, what I can comment is uh, maybe uh, around 10 to, in worst case scenario, 15% uh, CV. Okay. It says, do you see any evidence of degradation products on the CD during the run? No. So, um, I mean, I don't want to comment for every single AV serotype, but I would say the experience in our company is that uh, even at room temperature, uh, AV um, particles are relatively stable. And uh, within this run, which, you know, in the worst case scenario takes five hours if you have five CDs, I do not see any uh, degradation products. Okay, thank you. For the capture antibody with broad specificity, how many serotypes were recognized? For a good assay, what would be ideal in terms of numbers recognized? Um, I think it all depends what your assay wants to do, because uh, if you know that you're going to work only on one serotype, then having a capture antibody with a broad specificity may not even be something that you would want to have uh, or may just not be necessary. Um, I would say uh, 
again, if you have most more than one AV serotypes in your portfolio or potentially evaluating, then uh, obviously having a broader specificity gives you this edge of uh, using the same capture antibody all over again for different assays and makes uh, assay qualification easier as well because there are not that many critical, critical regions that you have to control. Uh, but again, this is like, you know, case, case by case basis, really. Okay. So there's a question in on, do you need to filter the samples prior to analyzing use on this platform? No. So what I do is, uh, so I have successfully also tested various in process samples in various buffers as well. Also on Yodic Saturn, um, uh, gradients, so really like, you know, viscous samples. Uh, I, especially during like sample dilutions, you eliminate any kind of matrix effects, but uh, I have successfully tested neat samples as well, and uh, that was really not a problem for me. Okay. Uh, so filtering is not needed. I think what Jarlab recommends is always to spin your sample, just to avoid any like, you know, visible aggregates to go inside the uh, like CD, because that will obviously uh, give you a, a bad measurement. Excellent. Thanks, Thomas. How important is the specificity in a bioprocess setting? Could one consider generic reagents on both sides of the sandwich when, when using for bioprocess purposes? Uh, I think potentially. I think it all depends to what your process control is and what's the purpose of the assay. So if you do it just in like maybe development lab or research lab, probably that's fine. But if it's a regulated environment, I think one of the point of the assay is uh, that you really make sure that you know what you are testing. And imagine if on one test uh, or one manufacturing site, you have uh, AB therapeutics with different, um, uh, I mean, made uh, in different AB these serotypes, then I think having this assay would ensure that you are not uh, testing another sample. But again, this is uh, part of your um, uh, ID um, settings and also um, sample um, control. Okay, thank you. So there's another question on is the system CFR compliant? And I, I can answer, obviously, as I mentioned during my pre presentation, that the system is designed to offer in the CFR 21 part 11 way. Obviously, it depends on your IT setup and uh, controls, et cetera. But yes, it, it's certainly suitable for operating in, in a GMP environment. So the next question is, what is the minimum amount of material required for your assay development? Um, that's a, that's a good question. Um, uh, I mean, minimal amount required per run, I would say, uh, of course it all depends how concentrated your sample is, but, uh, I would say, uh, I can easily work with even like 10 microliters, uh, uh, of sample that and then serially dilute in order to measure. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sorry, excuse me, one moment. So I've got so many questions. Mm -hmm, no I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to. Okay, did you see differences in the assay performance when quantifying from in process samples at different points in the purification process? Did you have to prepare samples any differently? Um, not really. I mean, um, I think that's also maybe the power of the uh, alternative method that we are using that uh, for, for the interpolation analysis, that it's able to pick up uh, also samples on maybe ec more extremes. So something like, let's say, uh, a very um, pure eluted fraction uh, versus uh, a sample which is just a cell supernatant when you um, uh, make AVs in, I don't know, like hex cells, for example. Uh, I think uh, um, you really do not have to to uh, treat samples differently. Uh, potentially what you would have to uh, think of is your dilution factor, but that probably after one or two experiments, if your process relatively stays the same, you can figure out and use uh, for both in-process uh, testing and also for uh, testing final samples. Okay, thank you. I mean, this probably slightly, um, you've put slightly answered this question. Have you tested or can you comment on spike recovery type of experiments which address the matrix effects? Um, 
I haven't seen really any particular matrix effects. Uh, I would say uh, I haven't done any formal testing for that. What I could comment on is, uh, for example, when I'm testing in process samples and then we are looking at the purification recoveries, we could see a very good trend of uh, the uh, process uh, um, uh, re re uh, recovery throughout runs, and that all makes sense as well. And maybe that's something which I haven't mentioned, which I always have in all my SA setup, also have quality controls, which I think are very important. So apart from um, making a standard uh, dilution series, which I then use to create a curve in order to interpret my uh, um, uh, capsitite of unknown samples. Um, I also uh, make uh, independent preparation of the standard at certain concentrations and then look at the, at the uh, recovery of uh, this quality control samples, which are nicely spaced out throughout my dose response curve. And I also have uh, system suitability criteria in order to then apply and uh, like state whether this, this run is uh, valid or not and whether the uh, subsequent quantification of my uh, samples with unknown titer is correct and accurate or not. Okay, thank you. A question here is, have you compared your platform with other, others such as the Octet? Uh, I have not. Uh, I guess for Octet that could work. Uh, I'm not sure whether that would be more laborious. I guess it would be. I think the good... Um, uh, advantage of this method is that you really can test in process samples and really messy samples. So like, you know, lots of, lots of other like proteins, even AVs uh, uh, coming directly from uh, cell lysis. Okay. So another question about buffers. What's the buffer conditions one can optimize to prevent the binding of aggregates? I think we've obviously already mentioned about detergents, but if you want to add anything else to that. Yes, I think like the detergent salts, uh, trying to maybe better understand whether it is the um, hydrophobic surface of your virus that it, it, you have mostly problem with. Uh, and I think uh, playing with different buffer conditions, uh, especially when it comes to detergent and detergent choices, may be something uh, very uh, uh, advantageous. Okay. So next one is, do you utilize a ratio of titers obtained from qPCR and ELISA acid to determine percentage of full AAV particles? If not, how much do you determine the ultimate purity for your AAV samples? Um... Uh, yes, I mean, we, we use, and to be honest, at the moment, we use a number of orthogonal methods and we are still evaluating what would be the best way forward. Uh, there are uh, some advantages and disadvantages of some methods. So I would say uh, no matter what method you're going to stick with, you still need to, uh, for for example, release specs half both capsid titer and viral genome titer. So inevitably, even if you have another analytical method in order to specifically target empty full ratio, uh, you can still infer the empty full ratio from the qPCR analyzer uh, or um, another um, uh, um, capsid immune assays. So I would really encourage you, even if you use another method, always to cross-examine uh, uh, this value also given by, the, by, this, by, the, by these two methods. We do, we do have um, a couple of questions about pricing and also about availability of potential JAROS kits for AEV. What I would recommend for people that have these questions, for them to contact their, their JAROS uh, sales or representative locally uh, to discuss it with you, because really we don't want to discuss pricing uh, on the webinar. So, But please contact us. And that pretty much uh, brings us to the end of the webinar. Thank everybody for participating. We will wrap up now and thanks again for everyone for attending. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, John. Uh, and thank you to our audience for submitting some fantastic questions. And Thomas, brilliant job there in dealing with uh, a great deal uh, of topics there, but a really informative discussion. And uh, I can tell just simply by the number of questions that came in that clearly our audience found this very valuable today. So thank you both indeed very much. And uh, the on-demand will be available tomorrow, so look out for an email from me. 
Uh, and then you can circulate that to anyone who you think would be interested. So thank you very much indeed for joining us today. And thank you again, John and Tom, for a fantastic job.